my soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Good morning. It has been said that the world of sled dog racing, you wonder why am I talking about sled dog racing, is famous for a truism. If you aren't the lead dog, the scenery never changes. In other words, only the lead dog gets to see what is up ahead. Only the lead dog gets to sniff out new possibilities and gets to choose a new path. For the rest of the pack, there is nothing but a view of bushy backsides. No wonder in life we are all constantly striving to be the lead dog. And maybe this is at the heart of the real problem with our culture in world today. We all want to be large and in charge. Who doesn't want to chart their own destiny? Who doesn't want to choose their own life pathway? Who doesn't want to decide for oneself? The problem for us as Christians is that Jesus has a rather startling response to that kind of attitude, get behind me, Satan. Our plan, my plan, your plan, no matter how big, no matter how small, quite often is not God's plan. Or at least it's not synced up with God's plan. I know this personally. And I know many of you do as well in your own life. Jesus tells Peter in a startling rebuke, that may be your plan, Peter, but it's not God's plan. The audacity. Your plan. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus reminds us, 21st century disciples, that none of us are lead dogs, that none of us get to be large and in charge, and we should know our place. And where is our place? It is behind Jesus, following his lead. And of course, we just heard the gospel. And we know if we're going to follow Jesus, it's not easy. Because it requires something of us. And Jesus speaks to it in the Gospel. We must deny that very prideful and self-reliant part of our being. In fact, it may be more than just a part. That which can often separate us from God. The part where we just know we are right about everything. And it is so terribly hard to do because it means that we see our true condition. And we recognize our weakness or our weaknesses. It's holding a mirror to the face and allowing us to see exactly what we are ignoring. Maybe others see it. But we're able to see it now. Are we ready to be regarded as a criminal and die? Are we ready to be viewed as foolish and placing our hopes in something that is considered by so many to be dead? This is what it means to carry our cross and follow Jesus. To deny, to disown, to renounce claim to oneself for the sake of that which is holy, that which is eternal. Can we? What say you, Peter? Not, not you. <laughs> you, the apostle. 
What say you, all saints? To set our minds not on human things, but divine things. Surrender. Surrender to the plan of Almighty God. The Lord's plan for your life for my life. You know, Jesus never said it was going to be easy. I don't recall anywhere in the Scriptures it says it's going to be easy. One commentator said that Jesus seeks to challenge us to waken the sleeping chivalry in our souls by the offer of a way than which none could be higher, none could be harder. He came not to make life easy, but to make people great. This is most worthy of contemplating. What does it mean to make people great? What does it mean for us to become great? Yaakov Smirnov, a comedian, moved to the United States many decades ago, and he moved here from Russia. And he was not prepared for the incredible variety of instant products that are available in the American grocery store. And of course, it's only gotten even more variety, if you will. And he says on his first shopping trip, he saw powdered milk, and it said, just add a little water and you get milk. And then he saw powdered orange juice. It said, just add a little water and you get orange juice. And then he saw baby powder and he thought, wow, what a country. Of course, he's joking. But we make these assumptions about Christian transformation, don't we? That people change instantly when they come to faith. That we've arrived. And when the water is added and it's splashed on your forehead, or if you've been fully immersed, that you're there, you're, you're here. Some traditions call it repentance and renewal. Some call it sanctification of the believer. Whatever we call it, many of us expect some quick fix. And according to this belief, when one acknowledges or is moved toward life in Christ, that there's an immediate, substantive, in-depth, miraculous change in our habits, in our attitudes, in our character. Perhaps some. We go to church as if we're going to the grocery store, powdered Christians. That's a new phrase. Just add a little water and disciples are born, not made. The thing is, is that there is no magic powder. The disciples of Jesus Christ are not instantly born. They are made in God's time. Not ours. They are slowly raised through many trials. The many sufferings and temptations, life, experience. I don't know about you, but I think we want the real milk. We want the real orange juice. We don't want the powdered version, right? Unless we're camping or something. <laughs> but I tell you what, genuine life changes when a life is changed and a life is moving closer to God and it seeks out that place closer to the Almighty, changes only begin when one comes to mature faith. And you know how that is? When we acknowledge our own wretchedness. When we recognize who we really are when we recognize that we need to repent, when we 
seek forgiveness and we can offer forgiveness to the other. It takes more than just time. It's about training, trying, suffering, and even dying. Dying daily. And it leads to what I said last Sunday in the course of one's Christian journey. At some point there must be some renewal of spirit where personal changes are effectuated in a relationship with God. To pass through the proverbial saving waters, if you will, means to allow one's heart to be set on fire for the Lord and Creator. And to recognize deep down in our souls that the very giver of all life has given a treasured gift. You. It's where it came from in the first place. When we wholly encounter the other and we are moved with empathy deep within our hearts for the sake of Christ, no matter the joy, no matter the sorrow. But let us not fool ourselves. A mature faith doesn't mean that we have arrived. It doesn't matter how old we are or how long we've been in this church or any church or where we are in life, we've not arrived. It's continual work until the day we die and rise in glory. And yet, we know there is nothing easy about following Jesus. And we live in a time when we are looking for the easy fix, the easy way in, the simplest process. You don't even have to even walk in a grocery store anymore to get powdered milk. They'll bring it out to your car for you. But it's not following Jesus. It's not the way with God. And if we go that way, we choose so, we can, but it's shallow. It's powdered. You just add a little water. Peter took Jesus aside and he said, no, your plan is not mine. Our plan, your plan, is not God's plan. Peter wasn't listening. I think often we are not listening. You see, many in those days, and certainly folks like Barabbas and others, that we see throughout the Gospels believed that the kingdom could be attained quickly and by force. Peter had a worldly view, like many others of the kingdom, and Jesus is speaking about the heavenly kingdom. Would Jesus ask us to do something that He has not done, we ask, or experience? Or would Jesus ask us to follow Him somewhere He has not been? Remember the passage from last Sunday, 1 Peter, the harrowing of hell. Even unto hell Jesus descended. And the various hells we experience in life, Jesus has been there. He's experienced everything and more that we have and can, even death itself. It is Jesus who makes people great. Jesus as Billy Graham said about the power of the Gospel, it is the simplicity of the message of the Lord that outwises the wise. The power of God in the simple and lowly. The humble and meek. There is more behind these words than we can even begin to imagine. They may look simple, but they are powerful. Who is truly wise? Who is truly foolish? There is no magic powder to solve the problems. We've got to think bigger. Big picture stuff. And how we can be as Christians in this ever-changing world. How we're going to be as church 
In many ways, no longer can we just sit back in the pews and wait for people to come. Yes, they're coming. Maybe not like they used to. We're competing with so much. And it is happening across the denominations. A long-standing trend. Yet we are unique people of faith. And following Jesus sets us apart. We're not a club in which people belong or seek status. We just simply offer a way of life that is contrary to the one the world promotes and a loving community. We need to proclaim that. We need to live into that. The future of the church, in my opinion, and I'm not just talking about this church, I'm talking about church with a big C, is just how it was when it came to be in the very beginning, in those early days of Christianity, before it was called Christianity. A group of Jesus followers, a ragtag group of folks following Jesus, holding community together as best they could, proclaiming the Gospel. They had, and we will need to have, some sort of edge about us. A gentle one. A gentle edge, I would say. And what I mean is perhaps future Christians, including us, need to be out amongst the people. Stirring up things with genuineness of character. Empathetically out of love for God's creation without judgment. In other words... We are called to take what we have here and what we do here and move outside these walls together with purpose as the Lord calls us. We must talk with God daily and ask for the strength and the courage to walk the walk, not just talk it. And the truth is to simply be one of the sled dogs moving toward the kingdom, which is who we are. Although someone reminded me earlier, we're prone to stray, and sled dogs have a hard time straying. That's another sermon. (laughs) Every step made in faith. That's who we are. It is an honor, and it is a privilege to be part of this movement. And so here's the question. And it has three answers. Why must we carry a cross? First of all, we need to be reminded that we are not at the center of the universe. It is not about us. Not one bit. Second, It is to remind us that there are others who suffer, even amongst us and outside these walls, and we're called to be with them, to bring that hope we know to them, and to walk alongside them. And finally, it is to remind us that we are responsible in part for the cross that Jesus carried. Remember this. Surrender your plan to God's plan in your life. It's hard to do. I try. It's not easy. Surrender your plan to God's plan. And let us listen to Him. And then we'll be great. Amen.